have you written as well? This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with Mr. Wayne Witter on Thursday, March 26th at 08.30 hours. We're located in the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we talk about your experiences in Vietnam, I'd like to get a little biographic information about you. How old were you when you went to Vietnam? Uh, 28 years old. You were an old guy. <laughs> yes, sir. I had previous service prior to that. <laughs> uh, what was your family status? Uh, I had an older sister, seven years older. She's deceased, and my mother and father. Not married? At that time, uh, no, sir. Marines hadn't issued you a wife. Correct. <laughs> uh, what was your hometown? Swampscott, Massachusetts, up on the North Shore, just north of Boston. What was your sense of the Vietnam War before you entered the military? I was already in the military when the war started. Uh, at that time, I was enlisted in the Marine Corps and enlisted in the paratroopers. And uh, uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, it was a job that professional soldiers uh, had to do. Had no opinion till I got there, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, when did you enlist? Uh, I went in the Marine Corps in the mid-50s and then uh, received an appointment to the Naval Academy. And I resigned after Christmas of that year to uh, marry the young lady that I was dating at the time. And uh, then I went down to Paris Island as a drill instructor and then up to uh, Lejeune, played football in 59. Then I got out. <laughs> and uh, you re-enlisted? Yes, I got, uh, after football season in 1960, I got separated from the, the gal I uh, resigned to marry. And uh, I went over and I wanted to go back in the military and I went to the Air Force passed all the tests, and, but they said I had to get a waiver because I had a wife and a daughter, and she wouldn't sign it unless I got my commission and 5000 in the bank, so that took care of my decision with that marriage. And, uh, I went down to the Army recruiter and said, uh, can you guarantee me the 82nd Airborne in jump school? And he looked at me because I had a Marine Corps high and tight, and he says, you're prior service, aren't you? I said, yeah, why? He said, don't waste my time. I said, okay, I'll go to the recruiter over in Lynn and talk to him. He says, you're serious. Yeah. He rips the paper out because no computers back in the 50s, 60s. And he started typing, and three weeks later, I stopped at uh, Fort Dix, got my uniforms, and three weeks later, I was in jump school at Fort Bragg. <laughs> <laughs> so when you went to Vietnam, you went as Army? I was an Army officer because I'd been selected. I'd worked my way back up. I went to Rigger School. Then the Major ordered me to play football because I'd played professionally. I didn't want to, but at the end of the season, he then chastised me for uh, shirking my duties as a parachute rigger and transferred me to the infantry. So I went to Charlie Company 1st 503rd Battle Group and within a year I had worked my back w way back up to sergeant and uh, many uh, trooper of the month, trooper of the month in the battle group, the upper division and got stripes and bonds and a 96 hour pass. So then my officers were all OCS graduates from Fort Benning so they said uh, Sergeant Witter, you, I was assistant operations sergeant at that time, and they said, you've got to go to OCS. So I was primed. I could have gone to Benning and stood in my head and graduated number one. And they turned around, and uh, we got back from Swiss Strike One. We marched 130 miles in three days from South Carolina back to Bragg. And, of course, everybody's hobbling around in shower clogs and couldn't have put on their boots to jump. <laughs> But I hobbled over there when they said, your orders are in. I said, how long have I got to get to Fort Benning? And they said, Fort Benning, heck, Sarge, you're going to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I said, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, what's there? And they said, artillery OCS. I said, I've been in infantry my whole life. You know, typical military move. <laughs> Send you where you didn't do. So uh, they said the board was really impressed with your 100 average in algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus in high school. So they decided you're going there. Well, 89, uh, 87 of us started, uh, Joe, and 29 of us graduated. At Fort Sill. Yes, sir. Once again, I was number one in leadership, <coughs> 29th academically, because you know when, Marines need When were you pictures. deployed to Vietnam? Uh, 1965. What, what date? Oh, I believe it was in September of 65. What were your first impressions on landing there? <laughs> uh, the odor the smells, uh, uh, looking out the window uh, on the charter flight, uh, it really was a very pretty 
country, beautiful country, and uh, even more so now that nobody's shooting at you. But it uh, it just seemed awfully crowded, uh, dirty, uh, and whatnot. But the people were very friendly, and I always liked the Vietnamese people. What were your, uh, where were you assigned? Well, I had volunteered for Vietnam after Ranger School, Joe, because I wanted, I knew that uh, I wanted to fly the Mohawk, and uh, so I said, if you'll send me to Vietnam, give me the Mohawk, I'll go to Vietnam. So they did, and after surveillance school, I got there in September of 65, and then I went to the 73rd Aviation Company down in Vong Tau, and everybody likes to kid me about, oh, you were stationed at a R and R in-country R&R &R center, <laughs> yes, and never spent much time there because uh, I volunteered for the infrared Charlie models. We had uh, three different models. They flew in pairs with armed models. In the had you time. gone to flight school? Oh, yeah. You, you cut me off on that one. I went from OCS to flight school, back to Bragg, the Corps Artillery Aviation Section, and then I got Ranger School. That's another funny story I won't get into, but the, my CO was the son of uh, Colonel uh, uh, in brother, uh, Band of Brothers, the Colonel, mm -hmm. the Colonel Sink. Well, my CO was Major Sink, his son. I didn't know it till the Band of Brothers came out. He got killed over there in the chopper, but uh, he signed the paperwork, and just as he was coming down to my application for Ranger School, the, uh, <laughs> I was counting them behind my back. I said, sir, do you want to take that test flight today? And he said, no, I can't. And he signed two or three more papers. And when my orders going, Lieutenant, where to get in here? He says, how did you get orders to Ranger School? I said, you signed it, sir. He says, I did? And I said, yes, sir. I said, you're too young to have that, you know, old timers. And he get out of my office, and I heard him murmur. He says, never mess with an old sergeant. So <laughs> I went to Ranger School and then volunteered for Vietnam, and that's got the Mohawk School. And you went to Mohawks when you got to Vietnam. Yeah, I went to the 73rd Aviation, and I flew C models. I flew infrared 500 to 1,500 feet above the ground all night, Joe. What were your, your initial duties? Well, I was the uh, daily pilot. routine. Daily routine was try to sleep because we flew all night, two, four and a half to five hour missions a night. And uh, we had an enlisted TO, technical observer. And uh, these guys were so good when we were working with the artillery. Uh, the Australian and New Zealand artillery was uh, unbelievable. They'd say, are you clear, Hawk? We're clear. And whatever coordinates you gave them disappeared. But he, these ETOs could throw the protractor up on that screen on the right-hand side of the cockpit, Joe. And within, I swear, less than 15 to 20 seconds, they could give you four-digit coordinates of the target. And we'd call them in. Usually we work with blind bat or spooky, which were uh, C-47s with the Gatling guns and 20-mic yeah. mics in it. And uh, we worked with them primarily. And uh, when we'd get a big target, like in the Adrang, when the troops were coming down the hill, uh, they called in to get artillery, and of course it was denied, and with that the flares came on. <laughs> but uh, they would clear the area and then call in. The, they had uh, aircraft stacked from the carriers and Da Nang and the different places, and they'd call them in when we were in Laos or Cambodia. And it was it was really rewarding when you'd get secondary explosions. But yeah, uh, even one of my classmates said he flew off the Kitty Hawk two tours. He was tired of uh, bombing suspected truck parks. Dropping his bombs we're, on trees. <laughs> you ba you were based in Vung Tau, but always TDY out of a duffel bag somewhere. <laughs> uh, out of somewhere, always yeah. moving. I supported the 101st when they came in play coup. I supported General Moore. Then the Seventh Cav when they came in and went into the Adrang. I spent uh, six or seven days flying out all night, every night over you guys. <laughs> well, thanks for keeping us warm. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were hot enough. <laughs> <laughs> what were your impressions of the Vietnamese people that you had contact with? Uh, I really am a trusting person, to, so to speak, but my head's always on a swivel to make sure I know who's around and what I'm getting into. But I, uh, I always liked them, and they were hardworking, and uh, I never had any problem uh, with theft or anything else but uh, you know I heard the stories of the, the maids being VC at night <laughs> oh I will share one story uh, when I first tour you had to go down with another pilot to get a haircut or anything else to 
he'd sit there and watch you and you know in case something happened and uh, when we came back uh, on the second tour I did get the 73rd again turned around and uh, I said are you gonna get a haircut come on down he said you don't have to do that anymore so when I went to the barber shop and I asked where I forget his name now, but Will Lau was. Uh, they say, oh, he dead. And I said, what happened? They, VC. I said, the VC killed him? And they said, no, he VC. <laughs> so he would cut our hair in the day and then go out and try to <laughs> rocket us at night. <laughs> then I said, this is a crazy war. <laughs> uh, describe your friendships with and your impressions of your fellow soldiers that you flew with? It was like anything, uh, Joe, anything in life, uh, some outstanding, excellent, and then you got guys that always are bending the rules. Uh, and of course, some of us are devious and uh, like fun. We had two COs, and I, when I first got there, I said, we had a 3.75 rocket for each CO in the club of the bar in our, in our uh, uh, complex. And I noticed one of them, the second one down, was painted yellow instead of being the OD. And I says, uh, how come they you got the nose painted yellow? And he says, he would never fly. So oh. that happened to the CO that I happened to have at that time. And he was livid because the rocket with his name on it, the nose of it kept getting painted yellow. And he, <laughs> he even set up cameras trying to film who it was. He never caught us. <laughs> <laughs> but my fellow men, uh, another kid, funny story, I won't repeat the name because he became a lieutenant general, but he was a captain and came in in charge of our uh, infrared platoon. And he says, Lieutenant Witter, he says, why is it all the enlisted men come to you? Uh, don't they know I'm the platoon leader? I said, yes, sir, they do. And he says, well, why do they come talk to you about everything? And I said, because I walked in their shoes. And he looked at me and said, you borrow their boots? <laughs> now, this is a West Point graduate. <laughs> and I said, no, sir. <laughs> Having gone to Canoe U, I had to have some fun with them. I said, no, sir. I said, uh, I was enlisted, so I know what that And he, you were an enlisted man? I said, yes, sir. And he kind of, uh, well, how do they know? Uh, I'm a West Point graduate. I said, yes, sir, they know that. And he says, how do, how do they know that? And then the devil in me came out. I always got a low grade intact. I said, they saw your ring when you were picking your nose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't talk to me the rest of the night. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Uh, what, what did you do for recreation or off-duty activities if you had any off-duty? Uh, having f flying all night every night, uh, it was a rarity. That was one of the rare nights that we got a night off. And uh, but we would go out uh, in the courtyard of the uh, uh, compound and we'd play volleyball a lot, and that was a lot of fun because you know you, some of the tricks of volleyball is to make sure you have beer in your mouth and you can pull the net down. <laughs> 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 it was a way of uh, getting even with you know officers that uh, were not too <laughs> nice to you. <laughs> Do you have any specific memories of the popular culture at the time, music, books, film? Uh, don't start laughing at me, Joe. Uh, I've got all the, uh, you remember the reel to reel? Oh, yeah. Uh, I've got probably a hundred of those, and they're still good, and it's got all the music from those over there. Uh, uh, I remember the music, and I got a chance to meet Adrian Cranauer. Good morning, Vietnam. I mean, it. That was really probably the one of the greatest things for morale when we were there is his show, and of course they poo-pooed that and got rid of him. But uh, I've got all that music still, and every once in a while I'll regress. I have a big military library in my house, and uh, people love to come. My wife says when we have dinner, to go get the guys out of the library. But I have uh, carbine from when I was in the 82nd, and M1 with a ceremonial stock when I was in the Marine Corps. And, my swagger stick from drill instructor days, but I've got three shelves of books signed by authors like yourself that I know personally or have become friends with that, uh, and people just love to come in and look at all this memorabilia and whatnot, and 
It's a good way of, uh, when I get young men that, that want advice or something and their fathers or relatives bring them over, I show them this stuff and then I get into my freedomism free speech. <laughs> so. What what areas of operations did you serve and fly in? I Corps, two Corps, three Corps, four Corps, and of course we were never in Cambodia or Laos. <laughs> and then uh, I did get, when we were, if you're familiar with Operation Market Garden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, we, uh, there were two of us that volunteered. And no, I wasn't looking for medals or anything else. If a guy tells you he wants to make a lot of medals, get away from him. He's going to kill you. or get you killed. But um, it was just the job needed to be done. And uh, But I, uh, I got to uh, map the parts of the Haiphong Harbor. We went up in a pair of two infrareds. And, and then the Navy came in and laid the mines. Mm. So there were a lot of things that were very, what I call satisfying, and there were others like you couldn't touch them if they went into the Michelin rubber plantations. That just drove me nuts. Well, three hundred dollars a piece for rubber trees if you blew them up. That and the night that uh, we were working with you guys in the I Drang, and the, we called in the coordinates for the uh, and Blind Bat said Saigon wouldn't let the artillery fire. Hmm. In the middle of the night like that, and I went, I went, I looked at my TO, technical observer, and he looked at me, and I said, something wrong here. But, uh, and today, I won't get into it now, or maybe later, but today, that's that's the thing that bothers most of us. Uh, we fought, in fact, I have a sign in my car, you might have seen it in the parking lot, it says, uh, shows a marine sniper with his dog. and. Below it, it says, we fought, we bled, and too many have died, protecting our country and constitution. May the Lord have mercy on us. <laughs> so, uh, What were your emotions at the time? Uh, it started uh, some of the emotions of frustration, but like I say, at times when you could do good work, get secondary explosions, protect the troops on the ground, and let them know where the enemy was coming from because we could pick up the heat if they were lying there eating their breakfast or taking a break and then they got up and moved. Within 30 minutes if we flew over we could get the difference in the heat of where they had been laying and the rest of the land. And we knew exactly, these TOs, would, uh, technical observers would know exactly whether it was troops or uh, animals, water buffaloes or what. So we could say yeah they had a mass here of say 100 troops and they moved east at such and such. So the troops in that area were warned, hey, you got some guys coming. And a lot of times we could call in the artillery, like I say, and it was great just to watch that whole area disappear, including with the rice and the VC. <laughs> what's, what's your most vivid memory of your service in Vietnam? <sighs> you talking about good or bad? Or <laughs> most vivid. I guess the most vivid, Joe, is when uh, I was a liaison officer. We take turns going up to Saigon to sign all the missions to our Mohawks. Uh, I was coming back because it was, oh, it was about 9, 30, 10 o'clock one night. I had to get some stuff out for the morning missions and stuff. And uh, two one thirties pulled in and they started bringing the body bags off. And I just stopped my vehicle. I was going back to the quarters that we stayed at in Saigon. And I watched for about a half hour. And then the next day I asked this colonel, I said, why, why did I see all these bodies coming in last night? He says, none of your business, Captain. And then uh, I think the other thing was I started to see the political part of battle when you're serving your country because I read the Saigon Post one day and it showed, told them exactly, cook your rice under the river banking and everything else so they can't, because they got this machinery that can find... I went to the colonel and said, what, what, you're telling them how we catch them and can call in artillery and everything? He says, you're out of line, Captain. I said, no, I'm not. I'm sending missions down for my fellow pilots to fly, and you're telling them how we're getting them. And, of course, he uh, proceeded to chew me out and all this stuff, but uh, I always got a very high grade in tact <laughs> in my efficiency report. High efficiency reports, but I got a... For some reason, I'd always get a zero or one intact. <laughs> so. Describe for me the best day you had during your Vietnam tour. The best day I had? <laughs> Getting my orders home. No, seriously, the best day I had one night, we were working the trail over in Laos with the 
carriers off the, and they were stacked up there, and we got a huge convoy coming down there, and we pulled, we told uh, Blind Bad, or Spooky, you got a three mile long convoy coming, and mostly trucks, a few bicycles, all this other stuff, and he says, clear the area, Hawk, and we said, yeah, we're clear. And man, those jets came in there and there were nothing but secondary explosions off, you know, just a whole long mile or two of explosions. That, that I mean, we're up there cheering, yeah, wow, oh, look at that. <laughs> that was really exhilarating. <laughs> Finally, we got some results. <laughs> Describe for me the worst day you had during your tour. I think it was watching, the, getting mortared occasionally and. Uh, but I think it was watching those bodies come off secretly at night. Uh, I just, that really started. Where were they coming from? Different battles. They would bring them in at night so that the press and people wouldn't see it. And I guess that's where I started really getting doubts. And I mean, I was a gung-ho professional, military school, Marine Corps. Every, um, I really believed in what we were doing. I believed in my country. I believed in the oath of office I took to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, domestic and foreign. Now we need to take more action against domestic than foreign, but that's another point. I've always been politically correct, as you know, Joe. <laughs> How much contact did you have with our allies, i.e. the Koreans, the Thais, the Filipinos, the Aussies? Uh, the Aussies flew out of Hung Tau with us, the uh, caribous, and Got to make friends with a lot of those guys. They were really neat guys. And I uh, also worked with some Koreans, South Koreans, and they're sharp and uh, they're good military people. So you knew if you were going to be flying out of an area that the South Koreans basically had control of the air base and everything else, you knew that Charlie, uh, the RVN, uh, regular Vietnam military, were not going to come anywhere around there because uh, the Koreans put on a great demonstration in a village. and. After that, they turn all the VC over to them. <laughs> so, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but they were, uh, I didn't uh, have any contact with the Thais other than going to Bangkok once, but, uh, and that I let go. <laughs> Good shopping, I'll put it that way. <laughs> you go broke saving money. But uh, the Aussies, the New Zealand artillery were just the best in the world, and I was an artillery officer. But they, they could put it right, like I say, right down the stack of whatever coordinates you gave them. They were unbelievable. And um, what, was well, the, what was the question again? <laughs> no, you pretty well covered okay, it. Okay, good. Uh, what was your general impression of the Arvin? Some of the units were outstanding and could be depended upon, but there again, they had others that were very poorly led or had political appointees as officers, and so uh, you better watch your back. And uh, then I had a lot of friends that were out there as advisors with them on the ground, and you'd run into them uh, someplace, wherever you were, and they would uh, say that they were pulling their hair out because these guys, uh, they just wouldn't follow instructions and, and uh, they couldn't be depended upon. Now your mountain yards and your nungs and the rest of them, they, oh, they were some of the best fighters that you could ever, like the Greeks, the Turks and whatnot. But uh, when we left, we just left them to be uh, annihilated by the North Vietnamese. How much contact did you have with your family back home? Uh, I would say my, uh, at that time, I was married. Uh, I had married an older, uh, United flight attendant. And, but anyway, um, I would probably hear from my father and mother once a week, once every 10 days. And uh, my wife was like about every other day. She lived in uh, California, San Mateo, and while I was over there. How much news did you receive about the war from home? too much, and I finally told them because they'd send me articles and uh, comment on what was being uh, printed in the paper and everything else and some of the things they'd see on TV, and I said, uh, it got to uh, right away, with, I'd say within a week of reading this stuff, I'm saying, that didn't happen. This didn't happen. What? 
it was like night and day in the stories that they were getting versus what we were seeing and experiencing. So I said, please don't send me anymore. Tell me. You just cut it off. Yeah, well, I asked them not to, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> were you aware, aware of any particular political or social events or movements back in the States? Uh, not really, because I was out when the Tet Offensive came and all the riots. and um, I had mixed emotions on that because, uh, to me, it was kind of uh, rebelling against your own country. And, uh, you know, like he said, be she right, be she wrong, she's still my country. But uh, I would have to, in today's environment, in my age, and what I've learned in, a, you know, 50 years since uh, I was over there, that uh, sometimes you've got to stand up and be counted like that. And it, it is right because everything else that's going on in Washington is wrong. And it's not because of parties. Uh, I, somebody said I got a million one-liners. I said, not yet, but I'm working on it. But to me and others, the only difference between a Republican and a Democrat today is pronunciation. We need people that will take and do what's right for the country, not them and the party. But I'll get off that platform. <laughs> uh, when did you return home? Uh, in nine, late 1966. And... Uh, on the way to uh, Germany, flew the border over there uh, for a few months uh, with the SLAR, the B model. And that's when they still had the wall and the, everything else. And the Russians would take the Fulda ADF and try to pull us across the border. And then you could even pick it up on the scope. There was a MiG flying up the other side waiting on you. And, but uh, that was fun. We'd laugh and play games with them. But uh, I got home for good in June of 67 and started with Delta Airlines in uh, 3rd of July 1967, which was my folks' wedding anniversary. Uh, how much contact have you had with fellow veterans since then? I belong to 10 different vet groups, so I can... Basically, it's, it's as I tell people, they say, God, you're, you know, the stuff you've done, you ought to write a book and everything else. I keep telling you, Marines can't read. We have to look at pictures. But... Uh, it isn't about me, and uh, it's about helping uh, your fellow man. Uh, the good book says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And uh, I'm, I'm constantly involved helping people, not for the uh, glory or the, you know, the credit. Um, I will give you any, well, I, I don't want to say it on here because then everybody will know who it is, but I know uh, <laughs> a lot of people, uh, if they donate something, they have their name put on it. And, Everything and and to me that's uh, hey look at me, and uh, I have a friend that uh, all his uh, donations are made. Uh, for example, we the uh, Gold Star Memorial Family Memorials have just received a hundred thousand dollar gift from that great Greek philosopher and philanthropist Anonymous, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he has them sign an agreement. If they ever tell anybody who donated it, they have to return it. And that's the way it's supposed to be, uh, just like this 87-year-old guy I took over to the VA Friday. He had an original VA health card, white, with just his name and a number on it and a date. And the girl started telling him he had to fill out all the uh, financial data and everything else. And I said, no, ma'am, he doesn't because he's a Vietnam vet, and that was exempted in March of 2014. And, oh, no, it wasn't and everything else. And, you know, I've I've mellowed in my old age, Joe. She happened to be Vietnamese, and so I didn't say what I normally would have said years ago. But I, I said, let me talk to your boss, whoever he or she is, ma'am. And uh, she comes back in a few minutes, and she says, you're right. And I said, would you call my wife and tell her that? <laughs> and so that got her, you know, not so upset and everything. Long story short, in one hour, I was able to get him a new picture ID and get him in the bronze clinic so he can have some of his ailments start right. to be treated. And that, to me, is what it's all about. Do you have any difficulty readjusting the life in civilian life? Yes, I did, and uh, I'm 100% disabled right now. Uh, all my one-liners, I found out, was to not think about some of the stuff I saw and did. Uh, and I 
actually had it pretty easy compared to especially like Joe Marmon, the grunts and the eye drag. And to me, the grunts, uh, they, they're always the backbone of the military. And uh, that's why I, any time I could do anything to help them, it just made me feel good. But uh, I feel like we were treated wrong, not when we came home by the people and all this stuff, but it was all just a political show and then the more and more you read in the history and find out about what was going on here and in Washington and everything else, you're disgusted because you have so many friends, as you well know, that they're on the wall. They didn't make it home. They're the real heroes. Yeah. I mean, you can have all the decorations in the world, and you know all the guys with the Medal of Honor say the same thing. I'm no hero. The real heroes are buried under the crosses and on the wall. And, and uh, that that's what I... Uh, got so upset about and I had a very short fuse. I worked for Delta for 34 years and I didn't put up with any nonsense. You do your job and if the passions were unruly I'd throw them off. Sometimes I wouldn't land to do it but I mean no. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a matter of I was always angry. Always wanting everything to be perfect. Well, that I guess was my human nature with German and whatnot but I, uh, I just couldn't fathom what people were doing and saying because to me, I'm old-fashioned, I tell people that, that to me, when I look you in the eye and shake your hand, that's my word, my bond. I'm not going to break it unless something that comes up that forces me to, and then I'm going to call you and tell you. But honesty, integrity, all, all of the words that we grew up with, they still matter to me. Is there any memory or experience from your time in Vietnam that stayed with you through the years and had a lasting effect on your life? It, <laughs> that's sort of a twofold question because the frustration and the anger is one, but on the positive side, uh, as you well know, and I tell all these young men and women when talking to them, you don't fight for the flag. You don't fight for the country, the Congress, or anything. You fight for that guy to your right and that guy to your left. And you'll form bonds closer than you would with your own brothers. And I said the uh, Marines have a saying that all men are created equal, and then some become, a few become brothers, and it shows three or four Marines in combat gear. <laughs> and I had a guy when the Medal of Honor convention was uh, going to be in Knoxville, I had a uh, classmate who was a Marine going through Naval Academy prep school with me. I had not heard from him in 56 years. The phone rang. He lived in Knoxville and wanted to have a beer with me. Uh, now that's what I talk about, the uh, brothers. Did your experience in Vietnam affect the way you think about veterans returning from combat today? Yes, Joe, and our group, I mentioned the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association, AVBA, that has put up 26 memorials here in Atlanta each the Thursday before Memorial Day each year uh, for a fallen vet. Uh, I made sure, oh, we all... Basically, it was unwritten, and then we unspoken, and we did it. We're going to make sure that these guys and gals never get treated the way we were treated when we came home. And uh, I couldn't understand when we got back to uh, the, this country. So many people don't go down to San Francisco in uniform from Travis, et cetera, et cetera. And we're all going, what? Because, you know, the Korean vet, any veteran was always treated with respect and honor when I was a young man, and it was a proud profession. Uh, as Colonel Boyce, a friend of mine that helps Colonel Mike Boyce, retired Colonel Marines, he says, Wiener, he says, in a perfect world, and that's when I know I'm getting a lecture from him, but he says, you know, people aren't going to do what's right anymore. It's all about material things, money, power, and it always has been, but not so flagrant. So. Yeah, I'm, uh, that's why I guess I work so much with the vets, trying to help them, uh, Joe, because there's a lot of guys out there worse off than me. It's the old deal, my daddy. Uh, two things my daddy told me that stuck with me is, son, first hundred years will be the hardest. <laughs> and the other was, son, I was home from the paratroopers, and I remember I was griping about something. He said, son, the Lord gave you one mouth, two eyes, and two ears for a reason. 
And I said, what's that, Pop? He said, keep your mouth shut, your eyes and ears open, you'll find out you don't have it so bad. There's always somebody worse off than you out there. And in my group therapy session uh, yesterday, another Marine, his recon, three out of four years he was in Vietnam in the jungles as a recon. This is one big tough son of a gun. But he and I gave some advice to some of these guys because he's not as old, I'm the oldest guy in the group. And had two of them come up to him and say, man, I can sleep tonight. What you guys told me is just, that's the rewarding stuff, Joe. Forget, you know, the decorations and the other stuff. And I only wear this stuff because then I get, usually get some kid or somebody that will ask me questions that I give them the scrape scoop or I can witness to somebody about the only person that's in charge. And that's the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So. <laughs> How do you think the Vietnam War is remembered in our society today? I would say the average society, and I'm not kidding on this, they don't even know where it is or what it was. When you go talk to some of these high school kids today, because they don't treat them, teach them history, not even about World War II. You know, so I, uh, but when you talk to people our age and stuff, they, a lot of them used to say, and this is kind of encouraging, used to say, well, that, you lost that war. I said, no, we won every battle. Even Tet, we kicked Charlie's butt. The politicians lost the war. Because if you read history, I'm a big historian besides uh, <laughs> having a hundred average of math all through high school, <laughs> algebra, geometry, calculus, and trig. If they read General Yap's memoirs, if they had kept up the bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong, he said they were ready to negotiate a, treat, a treaty. Yeah, that's bogus. You think it is? It is. I know it is. It was in his he never book. He never wrote any memoirs. So that was some other gook up there that... Oh, no, it's some, some bogus thing Here. to make us feel good. But he never said that. Thank oh, you General for Moore and me. I, General Moore and I interviewed him three times. I remember that. So he never said that. He never said that. Then I will correct people as <laughs> you just me, and I appreciate that. Uh, did you take more away from Vietnam that was positive and useful than you invested in blood, sweat, and tears? Uh, not at first, but now at my age and looking back, uh, I'm very thankful for the experience. I'm very thankful for the friends I made. I mourn the uh, friends I lost. Um, I, I tell my boys when they say, oh, he's my friend. I said, no, friends is somebody you can call at 3 o'clock in the morning telling you're in jail for rape, robbery, or murder. And they don't ask, did you do it? They say, oh, what, what do you want me to do? I'll be right there. But I said, uh, acquaintances, yeah, a lot of close ones. And I think of one person in particular, Bob Keller, great pilot and uh, just a great guy. He married and everything else. And he had a week to go and he was sold his little motorcycle and he had all his, getting all his documents put together in his will. And, and a Navy observer came in because he was flying the daytime flights, recon. And he was riding with him and he'd been in country a week. Bob had a week to go. And you might know well, <laughs> where this is going. His roommate was the uh, was a major and was the uh, group leader that day. And they took some fire down in the Mekong and he said they were coming back to Vung Town. He said, hey, he said, drop down and, and take a look and uh, let me know if I took any hits. He says, all the gauges are good. And he said, I'm not losing fuel. And so he did and he was down. He says, looks good to me, boss. He said, no holes, no fuel. He said, okay. He said, why don't you take the lead? And Bob says, okay. Well, when he pulled up, he came right up through the right prop. Oh, cut the tail off the airplane. They they didn't even have a chance to eject because we had zero zero Martin vacancy. So he's a week to go, a week in country. They're both killed. Mm. And that just I mean, even talking about it today, I just get a lump in my throat and say, why? And most of us uh, that have seen the elephant and faced him in combat, you ask why him and not me. But I, I had a World War II guy who actually was fighting with his brother, and his brother took one right through the head, and he says, oh, man, he was all upset. And he said, but better him than me. So it, it's, it's a lot of human nature involved in that. But I, I honestly think I got a lot of good experience that helps me 
tell people what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And I've been able to counsel a lot of friends' sons who like just graduated from West Point or Annapolis and all this stuff. And I say, look, always remember, take care of your enlisted men. Be truthful with them, but don't get too friendly with them. Listen to the sergeants. Yeah, well, that's my next thing. I said, <laughs> now, your you gunnery sergeants or your SFC or whatever they call them in the Army, but your gunnies and your first sergeants, you listen to that platoon sergeant, that first sergeant. I said, you still get to make the final decision, but you listen to them because they've got the experience that will keep you and your men safe. So these are the things you pick up, and if you're willing to step out there, and, you know, I, I don't, it's like young kids getting married, friends of ours and, you know, the children of friends of ours. And I always tell them, I says, oh, you know, marriage is a 50-50 thing. I said, no, you want the key to success to marriage? Give 100% to your spouse. Don't be selfish, because if you're giving 50 to her or him, you're giving 50 to somebody else. And they all look at you like, and then they start thinking. That's what I love to do is make people start thinking. And that a lot, you can do that a lot with humor. <laughs> Have you been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C.? Can't count the times, Joe. We go up every Father's Day, and we put roses in the notes at the names of all the Mohawk guys that were killed. What are, what are your impressions when you go there? Mostly, and my wife has asked us, why is it you guys, when you get together, you're so funny in the stories you tell? I said, because you remember the funny stuff and you don't want to remember the bad. So you don't talk about it. I said, if a guy starts talking about how many people he killed and he pulled a grenade with his teeth, and I always have a few questions I ask. That, I mean, he probably wasn't there. But when you asked, I asked the guy, when he said, oh, I was in Venice. I said, well, welcome home. Well, thank you. Well, he didn't say welcome home back. Then I turned around and I said, uh, what corps were you in? He said, oh, I was in the Army. Didn't even know there was I Corps, two Corps, three. And then I, another question I have said, well, where did you see the elephant and face him? They got elephants in Vietnam? I mean, these are just little comments I ask, and right away, you know, he was never there. He was never there. So what, what, why are you saying that you served? It's, it's become popular now than when we got home, Joe, Yeah. to have served and served in Vietnam. So you got all these guys... I don't know. I see these guys that are getting picked up like that Marine guy saying he was a Marine general, a colonel, and had the Medal of Honor and everything, giving all those speeches up in Chicago. Big, uh, what do you call them, moratoriums? Monetary? Anyway, money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when he was exposed, I'm going, what? And of course, now, thanks to uh, uh, Senior Moment, Stolen Valor. Uh, oh. Yeah, over in Dallas. Yeah. But anyway, I worked with him and helped him on a couple of guys and sent a couple to him. But um, <clears throat> when these guys get exposed, how did they think they were going to get away with it? <laughs> no, they always claim to be SEALs or oh, everybody special SEAL forces. Today, yeah. I had, well, I had a very close friend. In fact, my, my guy that did uh, some work for me say he was a Navy SEAL special ops and now well, we got two or three SEALs, and of course I met Tommy Norris and some of these other guys. And I asked him, I said, was this, let me know if you would. And everything. He was never in the Navy, let alone a SEAL. And I'm going, why, why are you telling me this stuff, you know? It just didn't jive, and uh, so, you know, I, I lost a lot of respect for the man for that. Yeah. H have you heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War Commemoration Project? Yes, I have. Uh, in the what, last, are your, uh, what are your thoughts about that? I think it's great because, like I say, we won every single battle. The politicians lost the war. If politicians had to serve their country, not in the military, but in their country, two things I joke about, and it'll never happen, but they shouldn't be allowed to serve the people if they're a lawyer. And the second thing is they shouldn't be allowed to represent and serve the people if... They have not served their country first. Israel has a good thing, and so does Switzerland. You serve your country for four years, and then you go to college, or then you go into your father's business. People think Switzerland's never been attacked because of the mountains. No, every single one there has a gun in their home, 
and a bicycle given to them by the government after their four years in the service. So you'd have a hard time conquering Switzerland. Thank you, Mr. Witter. We appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. It was my honor to serve my country. Hey, sir. I got something for you.